Center for Media in downtown Cape Girardeau. Welcome to Focus on Southeast, a program on issues, events, and people impacting Southeast Missouri State University. I'm Dan Woods with KRCU Public Radio. On today's show, we'll be finding out about the latest happenings in academic affairs, learning more about the Chris Museum, and check in with the Conservatory of Theater and Dance at Simos River Campus. Dr. Mike Goddard is the provost here at Southeast. He's with me now. Dr. Goddard, Mike, good to see you. Good to see you as always, Dan. Thank well, you for having yeah, me. Yeah, welcome back to the show. I have several things I want to ask you about, and we'll see how much we get through before we run out of time. Okay. First, let's talk about what new degree programs are available now at Southeast. Yeah, we have a couple of this year that uh, we're thankful to launch and have uh, students participate in as they move forward. One of them is aviation management. I think some people know in the community that yeah. we started a professional pilot degree program, uh, believe it or not, just a couple of years ago. Uh, we already have over 100 students enrolled in that wow. professional pilot degree program. And what we saw was a greater need to expand kind of in that aviation portfolio okay. to be able to reach out for those who perhaps don't want to fly the plane, but want to be <laughs> a part of uh, airport operations and FAA and other types of avenues okay. that might be, uh, again, in that aviation management area. Um, and that's a growing, there's a need for pilots, right? Uh, tremendous need for pilots as we look about, uh, at the age of the pilots across the country and really globally, there's going to be hundreds and th hundreds of thousands of openings for pilots moving forward. And we all know kind of as we have expansions with airport operations and how that looks, mm -hmm. having those types of aviation management professionals will continue to be a, a priority as well. So if they don't want to necessarily fly the plane, now this is more to how, an, how an op airport operates, what kind of things would they be learning? Yeah, so and we're, we're really fortunate in this region to have great partners. And so we already have a great partnership with um, the Cape Girardeau yeah. Airport, and that's the city of Cape Girardeau. And Katrina Amos and, and her knowledge in that area that oversees operations on a day-to-day -day basis um, have been incredibly helpful for us. So we tapped into her knowledge as we developed out the curriculum for this program and really focus on several areas that she finds to be uh, critically important. Mm. And then will also lead to an industry recognized credential for individuals once they graduate from there, recognizing that they have um, the professional expertise to move into some of those airport operations types of uh, management positions. You know, it has to be challenging uh, from where you sit to sort of look ahead and see what degree offering should be available. And I guess this is one of the ones that you sat down and looked at and thought, this is something we need to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. Something that we knew that we wanted to be a part of our portfolio. Uh, certainly when we talk about uh, tomorrow's careers today yeah. at Southeast, this is one of those that we want to make sure yeah. we position our students to have that pathway to be successful. And really with any of our de degree programs that we launch and certainly even our, our existing de degree programs, we want to make sure that our students have the social and economic mobility to be able to progress through their careers after they graduate from Southeast. Mm -hmm. A couple of other new ones yeah. that we have. Um, we have financial econometrics. Well, okay. okay. Well, so you help me so with financial that econometrics is really <laughs> taking those aspects re regarding finance and econ, uh, but also building in a decent component of mathematics as well. So when you think about predictive modeling and those types of oh, things okay. that are critically important for business and industry, it'll position our students to be very successful in that regard. And, uh, we were able to take a lot of existing courses and really take an interdisciplinary approach to create this uh, Bachelor of Science in Financial Econometrics. And another one that's a growing area that we hear about, and now we have the program here at Southeast as well, is business analytics. Okay. So business analytics will be a part of our um, our business core. So part mm -hmm. it's going to be our part of our BSBA a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. So you'll take those core courses in business, but then you'll focus a bit more in areas such as computer science and those okay. areas that again will allow for not only just creating um, programming, that's not the aspect of this, it's really taking the data and how do you analyze the data and they then make business decisions based upon analyzing that data. Wow. As I, well. My favorite word of the day now is econometrics. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it? Yeah. Fun stuff. So so a lot of business related things. 
Yeah, business, uh, aviation, and then um, we have a couple of others as well that we kind of teased out a little bit, I'd like mm -hmm. to say. Okay. So we used to have a degree that's called Global Studies, and underneath Global Studies, there was a couple of different options that students could go into. Two of those options were Anthropology and Spanish. Okay. And what we decided to do is to separate those out. So now we have a standalone degree program in anthropology okay. and a standalone Bachelor of Arts degree in Spanish. We think it's gonna be easier for students to find those things, prospective students, yeah. and know that that's something that they can major in here at Southeast. Uh, we have been very fortunate in our anthropology area to have some outstanding faculty who do outstanding experiential learning types of things with their students every day. Uh, Dr. Jen Bengston is a great example yes. of that. Um, a lot of press in terms of helping communities, law enforcement agencies solve cold cases. And uh, very, very recently, another, another cold one. case was solved uh, from Dr. Bankston and her students. And so when we think about those types of opportunities and how we may be able to expand that out, that's, that's a great example. Yeah, I thought real world experience for sure Absolutely. right there. Absolutely, and, and helping communities and families. Yeah. Uh, as well. So yeah, we're, we're thrilled to have those two kind of separated out and, and then certainly provide those opportunities for our students. So let's talk about higher ed and the landscape, the challenges, so the challenges in enrollment. This is just nationwide and sure. now we have the hybrid classes where you can do in person and how's this all shaking out? Yeah, you know, I, I think as the landscape of higher, edu higher education, like you said, changes, we have um, a responsibility to be able to meet students where they're at and provide flexible ways for them to engage in education. And so part of it is new, new degree programs, but the other part is how do we do things and how do we provide those ways for them to engage. And being competitive. It's very and competitive. Very now, com right? and, and it is a competitive marketplace. We do know that there's uh, a fewer number of graduating high school seniors, and out of those graduating high school seniors, a smaller percentage of those are deciding to go on and get a college degree. The value of a degree and what that provides for generational change for students and their families cannot be understated. And I mentioned just briefly, the social and economic mobility. Mm -hmm. um, there's a difference between having a job and having a career. We wanna prepare our students to have a career and be able to have opportunities for growth once they, we, they earn their degree from Southeast. So before we run out of time, I yes. wanted to be sure to ask you about AI and ChatGPT in the classroom, and there's a lot of discussion about this. Kind of tell us where we are today. Yeah, so we've really engaged our faculty over the past, gosh, it's almost been a year since ChatGPT came out. It was wow. November of uh, 2022 okay. when it kind of hit the airways a little bit. And we've done a lot of work trying to educate our faculty. Our, one of our most recent faculty development days, we brought in an expert to talk just about AI in the classroom yeah. and the good and the bad. And so there can be good pedagogical uses for artificial intelligence and chat GPT, but part of that is on us to be able to educate our students on the appropriate ways to utilize that. And if done appropriately, it can provide a lot of opportunities uh, for students, not only while they're here completing their degrees, but once they leave and go into business and industry and the expectations they'll be to use that. And it's not necessarily the end all be all, but before we went on, I, you and I were talking about this a little bit. It sort of, if nothing else, can set a framework or give you just a, something to sort of get started with. Yeah, when we think about brainstorming types of activities yeah. that you do, if you punch in a couple of key words, you may generate some ideas that end up being very useful to you or outlines yeah. to kind of um, articulate out how you want to tackle a problem. Yeah, I knew we were going to run out of time. I know. <laughs> we'll have you back and we'll talk more. It's been good to visit with you, Dr. Mike Godard. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Dan. All right. When we come back, we'll be joined by the manager of the Chris Museum here at Southeast. You're watching Focus on Southeast, and we will be right back. Come on. Yeah. You're not going to get it all yeah. right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff, like making sure your kids are in the right seats for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat.
Welcome back to Focus on Southeast. The Chris Museum is a center for sharing and observing the ever-changing art forms of our time and those before us. Jim Phillips is the manager of the museum. He's here now to tell us what's happening at the Chris Museum. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Good to have you here. So tell us a little bit about the museum for folks maybe who haven't been to your facility. Well, the museum is a regional history and prehistory museum with attached to a fine arts gallery. So we're on a theme of crosswords. Why do people come to this part of the country? Okay. So the geology, the geography, the colonial period, the riverfront area, all these people came and utilized the resources here. And we try to explain how and why that happened. Because some of, some of the things that are there are just always there. I know there's exhibits that come in periodically, but that information is available for any time mm -hmm. somebody would come by, right? Absolutely. The museum is, is a place for students to come and study, come work, look at a world-class collection of prehistoric pottery mm -hmm. and other historical objects that have been donated to the university. And you do a lot of community events. Uh, at the station, we receive announcements from you, all the things that you're doing. Talk about some of the things that you do, the events you have, and how you decide on what, maybe it's usually crafty related, crafting. What kind of things, uh, how do you pick those? Well, we pick exhibitions a little bit by personal choice, meetings as a committee, soliciting for mm -hmm. material to come in and look at that. Uh, so yeah. One that I liked the most was Nathan Sawaya, the Lego artist. Oh, yeah. I saw him on Sunday before he got big on like CNN. And I said, hey, we should get that guy. And we were lucky. We got him. Yeah. We did an exhibit. That was in 2008. So if you see something that you think would be a fit, I'm sure it takes time to probably, because there's a schedule for those things that come around, right? We can plan up to three years out. So right now, exhibitions are pl planning for 26. And so we're, we're about a year and a half ahead regularly. One to two years is what we try to keep. When you look at exhibits that you want to bring in, I'm, I'm sure there's probably limitations on size. I mean, how much space do you have? And some exhibits may need more space than others. How do you sort of gauge that? Well, for some things, we just can't accommodate. So sometimes there's the one exhibit I wanted now would take 8,000 square feet, which is basically our ga two galleries, the lobby, the office section of the building. And so those become things that are just unrealistic. But we have just shy of 4,000 for the history displays. Mm -hmm. We have about 2,000 for the ga art gallery itself. And we do a variety of different types of shows, shows that are traveling, shows from faculty service shows, for like the high school exhibit, the 46th annual exhibit coming up soon. Yeah. Students for, uh, that is part of their major display in the museum as well. Do you hear back from, from patrons? Do you ever have patrons that come by and say, you know, I was visiting this town and I saw this exhibit and maybe give you some ideas on things to look into at some Absolutely. Happen? We've had people come by and say, hey, can you do this? Or we'd really like to see this. Or maybe photography is really big at the moment or painting, seeing some famous painters. We try real hard to stay current to try to get new things in and to keep the exhibits fresh. Mm -hmm. How many uh, exhibits do you have from local artists? Right now we have about two that are slate, they're open slots that we can put some faculty or we can put um, local artists. We recently added in a quilting exhibit. Mm -hmm which is, started out as an annual, but now it's gonna be biennial. Okay. It's very popular. So you can always do the local, and of course you have the national things that come by, or regional. I would imagine there's some regional opportunities are available too. Sure, sure. There are all kinds of different activities that we uh, try to bring to the public. We wanna bridge between the community and the university and the student body, getting everybody together to kind of enjoy their time together at the museum. I wanna get back to these, uh, these events that you have. Um, a lot of times it has to do with an activity. Um, is that a way to just get people involved in the museum, get them acclimated to what's available? Ideally, we want, we want everybody to come in. There are a lot of local people who, and, those, and students too, have certain who go, I never went to the museum. I've never <laughs> been there. I've lived right down the road. When yeah. We've been around since 1975, so the, the museum may have changed locations, right. but it's been here for a good long time. So the programs that we pick are one to bridge, like Legos and art, to get people who are not so intimidated by art and enjoy Legos. So we have a had that first exhibition. Now we do an annual family day, which is, nets about 600 people a, per weekend, which is a good way to get people into the, and when we do do workshops, we tried to first bridge them with the collections. Um, so we, like, we do chain mail, okay. like chain mail jewelry, but there was a chain mail shirt that was on display for four years that yeah. we, had, we had our hands on. So we kind of bridge to that, or to the Native American weaving. We do programs according to that. And fine art also for landscapes, people, and locations. Talk more about that family day, and what's that like, and what well, activities are there? Family day is really depends on which one we do. But the Lego day, we have free building. We have collectors in the area who will bring out their collection, the collectible items, and put them mm -hmm. on display. So this upcoming year, we'll have a three-foot-tall um, Eiffel Tower, um, okay. trained from Hogwarts, variety of starships. 
but also things that kids come up with their own. Did as you well. say starships? You starships. But starships. All right. Star so, Wars. Um, well, there you go. See, that's the kind of stuff. With people who collect, they really want to go. Oh, I, I really want to see that. And we've had really good reviews from that. Um, let's talk a little about something for next semester uh, in early 2024. Backstage Hollywood. Tell us about that. Well, Backstage Hollywood is the photography of Bill Willoughby, who was an American photographer who, instead of doing landscapes and cityscapes, chose to work on behind the scenes in the movies and industry, the, the film and movie industry. Okay. So his focus became what we think of today as uh, paparazzi, when there wasn't such a thing as paparazzi. Oh, okay. and so the artists brought them in, the, the um, studios brought them in, the directors brought them in, and he became very known for candid photos of people like Katherine Hepburn or Judy Garland shooting at the Wizard of Oz. Okay. So this is the kind of photos where they didn't know they were really being photographed and they get those real well, life. I knew like they were we there, know. but yeah, it was, it was those tender interspersed moments of r real person versus what you see on film. Yeah. So what do you like most about your job at the museum? I like working with people. That was the whole reason I came back to museums as a whole was I enjoyed teaching as an educator with various materials. And I originally came to interpret one collection and branched out to a variety of other things over the years. Do you talk with other museum directors around and you all kind of commiserate on ideas for things and how you might change things in your museums to keep people engaged? Sure, there are a number of listservs, but also going to conferences and meeting various directors, curators, registrars who have collections of their own and being able to look at those people and say, hey, we've got, we've got a nice little thing going here, we want to share it with you. And okay. maybe get a museum or another institution to kind of work with us on our collection. Like University of Memphis was recently photographed by a professor from University of Memphis. Okay. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. Of, of some of your recent exhibits, what has been the one that you personally just really just enjoyed? I really enjoyed June Kaneko. Why is that? It was big and it was a challenge. Okay. You know, we, we ended up with a forklift in the museum. Oh, wow. Um, the, the work was monstrously huge. It fit in a little small space. There was one piece that was 2,600 pounds assembled. So getting that in, technically working that out, worked with the art department, worked with uh, contractors to bring that, this exhibit together. It was, um, one of the questions was, can your floor handle the weight? <laughs> So very challenging. It was a very challenging, and that was probably my all-time favorite. Yeah, not great. Well, we're out of time. Jim, been good visiting with you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. When we come back, we'll stay on the River Campus and check in with the Conservatory of Theater and Dance. You're watching Focus on Southeast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Focus on Southeast. The River Campus at Southeast is one of the only campuses in the nation devoted solely to the arts and media. The Dobbins Conservatory of Theater and Dance is dedicated to each student's success and development as they train for a career in the performing arts. Kit LaVoy is an assistant professor of theater. He's here with me now. Hey, Kit. Hi, very good to be here. Good to have you back on the program. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Lanford Wilson New American Play Festival. First, kind of tell us how it got started. Give us some background on it first. Absolutely. Uh, it's a program that we have here that we started in 2001. It's now uh, going into its fourth year uh, that we're planning for. Uh, but it is uh, the only only new play festival in the country that is specifically focused on supporting new plays that fit the needs of university theater departments. So plays where all of the characters are between the ages of 15 and 25 so that students can play the kinds of roles they would actually be cast in in a professional setting and also plays that have uh, significant roles for female identifying actors because that's something there are a lot of in theater programs okay. and not enough uh, plays uh, that, that, that center their experience. So uh, we started this festival and for a week every year uh, we bring playwrights from all over the country plus some really top level 
level, professional directors and artistic directors, Tony nominees, artistic directors of major theaters to come to our campus wow. and do developmental stagings of these shows um, using our students as the actors. And then the play that's chosen as the winner of the festival, um, we actually do the world premiere of uh, as part of our season. This has to be tremendous experience for SEMO students. Yeah, it really is, and, it, and it's, it's a kind of experience that the industry really demands. My professional uh, career outside of, of, of teaching here is largely focused on uh, new works, new plays okay. and new musicals, and that's something every single play and every single musical that people love was once a new play <laughs> and once a new musical. Yeah. And they go through usually between a two and five year process of being developed before they're ever brought to the public. And it is something that out there in the world when you're working on what we find is there's a lot of actors in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s who are great at working on a new play where there are rewrites being done, where they're getting uh, notes from a playwright and things like that, and not a lot of young people who know how to do that. So we really want to be able to train our students um, to be able to be those young people that are in demand in those developmental rooms because usually it's the people who are in those developmental rooms that end up being in the original cast of the show when they premiere. I'm remembering that the last time we were on the show, we had some students here and they were talking about that very mm -hmm. thing. They would do a scene, there'd be some notes, then they had to change the next time to do it and that mm -hmm. has to be incredibly challenging. Yeah. Yeah, it's a real skill, and it's a skill, again, huh. most people don't get a chance to practice when they're in school, and we have found a bunch of our recent alumni are now in the developmental processes of right. shows that are now tracked to Broadway and things like that, that, um, you know, we're, we're, so far that part of the plan is working very well. well that's so. great. I noted that um, the 2022 uh, Lanford Wilson, uh, I guess the play that won, mm -hmm. has been put in the Concord Theatrical and has been published. Tell us what that means. Yeah, that, um, it, is, is I, I think, a very exciting thing for us, which is Concord Theatricals is the largest and, frankly, most important new play publisher in the world. Okay. And um, uh, they have a catalog of plays where both they make the plays available but also arrange performance rights for theaters and universities that want okay. to do plays. And so we actually have had, from the beginning, uh, a partnership with them. Uh, Concord Theatricals, and we told them what our mission was, they were like, yes, there is a lot of demand for that. And so part of the prize for the winning play um, of the festival is that they get considered for publication by Concord. And um, so now this play is being published uh, next month, and they always have in the front a list of who is the original cast of the show, and it's going to be our students who are in oh, there. Wow. Um, but it uh, is, is going to be something where hopefully it's going to be done at colleges around the country. And to be honest with you, one of the things that we said was our unofficial mission of the festival was we wanted to find the next The Wolves. And The Wolves is a play about a female <laughs> soccer team uh, that was just done by every college around the country because it was a great play for young women. And now if you go to the Concord website, it says if you like The Wolves, you'll love the Winter Guard play. And, okay. uh, you know, that's the Winter Guard play is the play that came out of the festival. So that's, uh, uh, we're very excited about so that. If it's in, if it's been published by Concord, I mean, mm -hmm. that's how everyone else gets access exactly. to it, right? So that's very important. Exactly, because it really is something that we want to be able to have a, be a training resource for our students about how to work on new plays, but we want to be a resource to universities across the country so that they can have plays that are appropriate for their students to work on, mm -hmm. because it is just the case most of the time is you've got a bunch of people, uh, you know, 20 year olds powdering their hair white to play a 40 year old and, you know, hurting my feelings. Um, but, uh, you <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's uh, as they're, uh, you know, but like that's yeah. not a role they're going to be asked to play in the professional world. So okay. we're really trying to add to the collection of theatrical literature that really gives student actors the kinds of challenge they need yeah. to prepare for the profession. Well, let's talk about next semester, uh, spring of spring 2024, mm -hmm. and our play. Tell us about yeah. it. Yeah, our play was the winner of the 2023 uh, uh, Lanford Wilson New American Play Festival, uh, and uh, it is a wonderful play. I'm actually going to be directing it. I'm very excited. Cool. We're in the process of casting it now. Um, but it basically is a play about a group of students doing a production of Thornton Wilder's Our Town, uh, which is a very classic American play. But it was written by Jessica Moss, who's a relatively recent graduate of the Juilliard Playwriting Program, and it is just 
a magnificent piece of writing that is so funny and so moving and mirrors the structure of our town in, a, in just a, a really smart way. And honestly, it's something I, I, I really think is very likely that Concord will publish this one as well. And just because of the kinds of, of issues it deals with and, and, and the quality of it, I really do think that's a play that, you know, three years from now, everybody's going to know that play and we're going to be able to say we were the ones who did it first. People who come to see it will be able to say they saw the very first production of it. And the, some of the some of the things discussed, I mean, school shootings and, I mean, very heavy, heavy topics. Yeah, I mean, it really is a, is a play that um, uh, that is, is both incredibly funny um, but then, yeah, there are some events that happen in the play that, that really take it for a turn, which is the same thing that happens in, in our town. And it's, uh, uh, it really is, is, is quite moving by the end of it. Before we run out of time, so mm -hmm. these new plays that are in part of this festival, and I guess new writers, it's important, I would suspect, to give them a forum to be able to write. And so like universities like Southeast that are doing this type of work, it gets these new voices out. Yeah, it, and that's absolutely a big part of our, our mission there is that we want to support those playwrights that are writing these kinds of plays. And this year, uh, we actually just last week, our deadline passed for this year's submissions, and we got nearly a 1,000 submissions this year. So uh, we have a group of faculty and students that are working their way through those plays, and we're going to end up uh, picking uh, five full-length plays and ten short plays out of those to bring to campus this summer coming up. 1,000? Yep. <laughs> it's going to be hard to weed through all of those. It, I would it certainly will. Yeah, and, and and they tend to be really great. But it, but it really is a testament to the reach that the festival is getting now. We're very happy with well, this that. This is really good, Kit. It's been good visiting with you. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you. Focus on Southeast is a collaboration of KRCU Public Radio and the Department of Mass Media here at Southeast Missouri State University. Just a reminder that portions of these conversations will be broadcast on KRCU Public Radio and will also be available online at krcu.org and on the station's YouTube channel. From the Russ Center for Media, I'm Dan Woods. Thanks for watching. Be sure to tune in next time when we focus on Southeast.